Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, evening service here at the Tron. If it's your first time with us or if you're visiting, let me say that you're very welcome indeed. And uh, we look forward to meeting you after the service. There'll be tea and coffee and so on downstairs. And you're very welcome to stay as we share a time of uh, informal fellowship together. But we're going to begin this evening as we began this morning, in fact, by singing a version of Psalm 103. This time, 103a in the book. So we're filling our minds with this great psalm of praise at the beginning of a new year. Psalm 103a. Praise the Lord, my soul is singing, and my lips are filled with praise.
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast covenant love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast covenant love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that this is the God that we know. This is the God who has revealed himself to us most fully and wonderfully in our Lord Jesus Christ. But from the very beginning of time, in your words of promise, in your words of covenant grace and mercy, following your people through the ages, dealing bountifully and mercifully, even when they transgressed and turned away, even when they faltered and failed you, even when your righteousness and faithfulness was met with unrighteousness and unfaithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that the pages of our Bibles are filled with testimony to your gracious kindness, to your long-suffering, to your ceaseless goodness to those upon whom you have set your love, your covenant love, your faithful promising love, the love that calls out to follow in the way of faith and love that promises to lead in that way all the days of our lives. And we thank you, Father, that wherever we open our Bibles, we find this same covenant grace and mercy the same God, the same promises, the same great purpose unfolding relentlessly from the beginning of history right through the great and marvelous culmination and the zenith of fulfillment in the coming of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And then ever since, as your promise has gone out into all the world, that Jew and Gentile alike, north and south and east and west, people of every tribe and language and nation might come to know the grace that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord and that that promise might continue to be proclaimed and that purpose continue to unfold until at last all is accomplished. And this whole earth is filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And so it shall be that there will be a great multitude that no man can number gathered together from the four winds, from every part of this globe, from every age and era of history, joined together as one in the Messiah, in the Lord Jesus himself, and made his forever, and made to belong unassailably in your family as children of the Father, whose heart is so open to us. For as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And though indeed we are of dust and flourish like the flower of the field, and these mortal bodies one day will be no more, the steadfast covenant love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. And you, O Lord, 
have established your throne in the heavens and your kingdom rules over all. And so our future is sure. Our future is certain. And in the midst of the shifting sands of this world, which in the year to come will no doubt throw up for us so many causes of fear and foreboding, of uncertainty, and perhaps of great human grief, Yet still, we know that we stand firm and sure because our God is the everlasting one. And so we join the psalmist in saying, Bless the Lord, all his hosts, all his servants who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And so, Lord, may indeed that be our song every day of this coming year. Bring what it may, that in knowing that we are your people, the people of the living God, the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an anchor which is firm and sure. And therefore, we may walk fearlessly and faithfully with our hand in the hand of the one to whom all issues belong and from whom all power and all authority springs. So, Lord, we come before you this night on the threshold of a new year to hear your word. May we respond with all of our hearts, we pray, and be found worthy of the name above every other name, the name you have bestowed upon us, the name of your beloved Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, just uh, a couple of notices this evening. Uh, on Wednesday, our lunchtime service uh, is still in recess, so don't come on Wednesday at lunchtime. But do come next Wednesday when our new series will be beginning. But do come on Wednesday evening at 7.30 when we meet for our first congregational prayer meeting of the new year, a time to bring our uh, prayers and petitions before the Lord for our many prayer partners around the world and indeed for uh, Christ's work all over the world as well as in this city and in our own church. So 7.30 here uh, to join your voice with ours. Then on Thursday this week begins our new Christianity Explored course. If you're here this morning, you'll have heard me explain what that is. It's a seven-week course simply looking at the words and the works of the Lord Jesus Christ through studying Mark's Gospel, one of the earliest manuscripts of the Christian faith. It's a great opportunity to find out at the very heart of what the Christian faith is all about. It's a great thing to bring a friend or a family member to. Uh, who is asking questions or wants to know more, it's a great opportunity for them to have all their questions answered. They can ask anything you like, uh, and we will attempt uh, to answer you uh, and to show you from the Scriptures itself uh, the things uh, that Jesus claims for himself and the teaching that the church believes. So it's a, a great opportunity for that. We meet at seven, there's a meal, uh, and then there's a short talk and discussion uh, and we'd love you to join in. There's uh, details at the front desk, at the reception desk. And if you're hoping to come, if you'd like to know more, please come there uh, after the service. And we'd love to tell you about that. And it would be such a help to know uh, numbers for the catering and that kind of thing. So do be uh, remembering that uh, for Thursday evening. Also, just lastly to say that there are uh, our... Uh, missionary prayer partners, calendars and things uh, available still. Many of you picked these up this morning. Calendars for the year and uh, these little bookmarks as well to pop in your Bibles. Uh, you do need specs to see these ones, but um, they will help remind you of the faces and the work of all our prayer partners and keep them in your minds as we pray together for them uh, this coming year. And you'll be able to get those after the service uh, on the stairs or down at the front desk. Well, we're going to sing again before I hand over to Bob to read the scriptures to us. And uh, you'll find it in our blue books again at number 257. 257, again, a lovely hymn for the beginning of the year. Tracing the God of the ages, the history maker, 
the God who plans our pathway and has held us fast all through the days of our lives, God of today, God of the past, and God of tomorrow. 257, God of the ages. going to turn to our Bible reading, and this evening we are in the book of Ruth. You'll find chapter 1 on page 222. We're starting a little series on this, um, a four-week series. Not every series needs to be as long as Jeremiah. So over the next three Sunday evenings and one Sunday morning in February, we're going to give our attention to this wonderful little story of Ruth. So, Ruth chapter 1, and we're reading the first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilian died. So the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. And may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them 
And they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to our gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? He said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, that's the passage you'll be looking at. But I want you to keep your finger there, please, and turn over to the Gospel of Matthew, to page 807. I'm going to read just a few verses here to place this story in its widest context. Matthew chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 1 to the beginning of verse 6. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab. The Minadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David the king. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to our hearts and to our lives. Now we're going to sing again the hymn immediately before the one we've just sung, number 256, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, His Wonders to Perform.
Now we're going to pause for a moment or two while the musicians play and we take up the offering. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you as the musicians have played for us. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. How we thank you, Lord, that you, the great God of eternity, the Lord whose throne is heaven and whose footstool is earth, has deigned to come and be with us, your people. How little we deserve it. And yet how thankful we are. We think of some words from, jo- from spoken long ago to Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, um, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause the people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. You may have good success wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Father, we know that promises specifically to Joshua at a particular time 
And yet it is a timeless promise to all your people. We have celebrated Emmanuel, God, with us in the last weeks. And we praise you that the Lord, our God, not just Joshua's God, but our God is with us wherever we go. At this point in the year, we want to look back with thankfulness. We thank you for all those who have built all those who have labored and whose labors we have entered. We thank you especially for those who, through whom the scriptures came to us. We thank you for Moses, who received the first revelation, and to the prophets, the historians, the wisdom writers, and others who followed him. We praise you for the apostles who were there when the word became flesh and lived among us, and for the way that in the, in the Gospels, in the letters, and in the, and in the pr prophetic glimpses of the future, that they have shown to us that this God is our God. We know, too, that you're the Lord of the present day. We thank you, Lord, that um, we do not have to go to the past to find you, because you are with us now. And yet, that past revelation is so important to us, and we can go nowhere without the book of the law. And so we pray that this year, in this fellowship here and in other fellowships, the, indeed there may be faithfulness to this word, faithfulness to this law, and that we will not move to the right or to the left. We praise you, Lord, for all your people who are facing this new year, some with apprehension and some with, and some with real hope. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord of the present, and you are Lord of the future. And Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. We have entered an unknown year. But you are the Lord of the years. There is nothing that will happen in these days that is unknown to you. And so we commit ourselves to you. We pray, Lord, for your world that you have made and that you love for the killing fields of the world, for the famines, for the earthquakes, for the strife and the disharmony, and pray indeed that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, for ourselves, in living power remake us, self on the cross and Christ upon the throne, past but behind us, for the future take us, Lord of our lives, to so live for Christ alone. And it is in his name that we pray and give you our thanks. Amen. <clears throat> now, before we look at Ruth chapter 1, we're going to sing again, number 848, another great hymn that takes us through all the days of our life and beyond. Lord of our dawning, Lord of our morning, our noonday, our evening, and then beyond to the glory of heaven itself. 848, Lord of our dawning. <clears throat>
Now, could I ask you please to have your Bibles open at Ruth chapter 1, page 222, if you're using the church Bibles. As we do so, let's have a moment of prayer. And God our Father, as we turn from the praising of your name to the preaching of your word, I pray that you will take my human words in all their limitations, that you will use them faithfully to unfold the written word, and so lead us to the living word, the Lord Christ himself, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> One of the prominent figures in 18th century London in circles of writers and thinkers was Dr. Samuel Johnson, who, among other things, um, produced the first usable English dictionary. Now, Dr. Johnson was a believer, but he had many friends who were skeptics and unbelievers. Very often, eh, he would meet them in the coffee houses where, where such people met at the time, and they would discuss the Bible, he defending it and them attacking it. One day he said to them, I find a beautiful little story of country life and ordinary people. I'm going to read it to you. And he did. And he read to them this book. We are starting the book of Ruth. He says, what do you think of that? They were loud and extravagant in their praise of the simple beauty of the power of the story. And he said, do you know where I got that from? Of course not, they said. And he said, the Bible, a book that you despise, a book that you scorn. That's really the first point I want to make about this story. It is a beautiful and moving story. Read it, first of all, as a story. Before you try to find lessons out of it, read it as a story. Enjoy it as a story. It won't take you long, about 10 minutes. You can sit down and read the whole story through. It's a short story. It's a story about sorrow, about love, about relationships. And even on that level, there's a lot to learn, and we'll see this as we go through it. But it's a book about ordinary people. Naomi and Boaz were prominent people in Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was an insignificant, out-of-the-way village. No, at that time, you have to remember at that time, Bethlehem had no particular significance to anybody. And I think that's a very important lesson in itself. As you were here this morning, heard Terry's vigorous and um, sometimes amusing polemic against the celebrity culture. And this is the problem sometimes we feel, oh, I'm not a big name, I'm not a big personality, I don't get involved in big projects, the Lord can't possibly be interested in me. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is interested in ordinary people. He made an awful lot of them after all, didn't he? And... Oh, okay. He can, of course, use the celebrities. God can use anybody. But God can use or and does use ordinary people. So this is a story about ordinary people. Johnson said a story about country life. But it's much more than that. If you look at the bookends of the book. Verse 1. The days when the judges ruled. And just over the page, the very last word of the book, Jesse fathered David. These are the bookends of the story, the reign of the judges, and then the great king David. Now, if you read the book of Judges, especially if you read the last four chapters, you'll find a distressing and terrifying story. A story of gang rape, a story of bloodshed, a story of massive idolatry. And four times in these chapters, including the very last verse, we read this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's how this book begins. In this terrifying, in this situa situation that's spiraling out of control, everybody does what was right in their own eyes. But God has a solution. And his solution comes in the last verse. David, the great king who is to get rid of, of that, um, uh, 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 that anarchy and so on, establish his kingdom. And even more so, 
lead the way to his greater son, which, of course, is why we read these verses in Matthew. Ruth has a hugely important part in the big story. You see, it's a story of ordinary people, but it's also a story of big events. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. The little stories fitting into the big story. This is one other piece of background I want to mention. The order of books in our Bible is different from the order in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, Ruth appears with four other books, the Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Esther, and Lamentations, the so-called five scrolls, which are read at the major festivals. Ruth was read in the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. Now, there's a very interesting thing there. If you look at the order in the Hebrew Bible, Ruth immediately follows Proverbs. And Proverbs finishes, Proverbs 31, with the picture of the woman, the wife of noble character. Exactly the word that is used about Ruth here in chapter 3, verse 11. You are a worthy woman. You are a woman of noble character. So if you're wondering who the woman of noble character is in Proverbs 31, here at least is one such person. In other words, the book is built into the fabric of the Bible's big story. A general title for this series is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, taken from a 19th century hymn by the hymn writer Faber, because this book shows God reaching out reaching out beyond Israel, reaching out beyond the chosen people, indeed in this case, reaching out to the old enemy, Moab. And the title for this first first, um, sermon is An Outsider Responds. And the story of chapter 1, which we're going to look at now, develops in three scenes. It's a story, so we expect it to develop in scenes, in acts, and so on. And first of all, verses 1 to 7, we have a dead-end journey. This scene is bleak. If you read verses 1 to 7, there is very, very little to encourage. The chaos of the judges and famine. Now, the writer doesn't exactly say that the famine is caused by the chaos and anarchy of the judges, but it's extremely likely, as happens today in places like Somalia and Sudan, the activities of warlords, while not actually causing the famine perhaps, make it worse. That's the situation. And a famine, ironically, Bethlehem means the house of bread, the bread basket, if you like. And all of us have experienced something like this at different times in our lives. You set out with real hope, real expectation, a new chapter opening, a new adventure, and then it turns to dust and ashes. And this is exactly what happens here. Naomi and Elimelech set out on this journey, <clears throat> journey of 50 miles, not terribly long nowadays, but quite a long journey for that time. They set out from Bethlehem in Judah. They were Ephrathites. Ephra is the ancient name for Bethlehem in the book of Genesis. There are two things I want you to notice about this opening scene. First of all, a real tragedy or a real series of tragedies happen. In many ways, the closest parallel to this in the Bible is the opening chapters of Job. Life has become grey, future has disappeared, the early promise, the sons marrying, and then death strikes. We're not told how they died. We're not told anything about the circumstances. Because ultimately, after all, this is death itself, which is the tragedy, isn't it? This grim frontier post that brings a dead end to all our hopes, brings our Cat catches us in a way that we cannot handle. Death is terrifying. Three widows left alone and destitute. Now, the author doesn't comment. Some of the commentators say um, they were wrong to go to Moab. 
It may be the case, because, and but the author doesn't emphasize that. And I don't think we should import things into the chapter that aren't necessarily there. Were they wrong to go to Moab? We don't know. But God overruled in any case. There are two extremes we can fall into. First of all, thinking that unless we get absolutely everything right, God is not going to be interested. Well, who, who among us has ever got everything absolutely right? Indeed, looking back, I often, more often feel I've got everything wrong rather than I've got everything right. And this nonsense, I, I, I used to think it was rather spiritual, kind of saying God has no eyes but our eyes, no, no tongues but our tongues. I come to realize that that is nonsense and dangerous nonsense. God, that implies that unless we work, God can't work. Where were we when God said, let there be light? For example, God has no eyes but our eyes, no voice but our voice. You, you, see, you see what I mean? Even when we get it wrong, God can and does overrule. And the opposite extreme, of course, is thinking our actions don't matter. It doesn't matter how we live or what we do, then God will work things out. Well, that is true as well. Now, C.S. Lewis said, we will ultimately do the will of God. But it will make a big difference to us whether we do it the way Judas did it or the way that John did it. And you see, in this book, as we'll see, it's particularly in chapters 2 and 3, the dynamic that drives the story is God's providence and human actions. In chapter 2, we're going to see it seems as if it's all God's providence. In chapter 3, it seems as if it's all human action. But it's the two of them together that provide the dynamic. So we are faced with this real tragedy, heartbreak, sorrow, the end of hopes, and the end of a promising beginning. <clears throat> now, the second thing I want you to notice about these verses is particularly in verses 6 and 7. God is at work. Verse 6. She heard that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Now, you can read that on a literal level, saying there had been a good harvest following a series of bad harvests, and that's true enough. But it's this word visited. This is the great biblical word that's used when God intervenes to save his people. Remember Luke chapter 1, Zechariah says, the, the rising sun from heaven has visited us. When God comes to his people, this great word in both testaments is used. And this, and this is not just bread in the fields, this is bread from heaven. Yahweh the Lord has shown that he has not abandoned his people. And this is the link in the chain which is going to lead us to Emmanuel. Of course, it's why we read these verses in Matthew. <clears throat> From this uh, Moabite girl who leaves her home and everything she's known is to come Emmanuel, God's presence and his very self. But from the human point of view, it's a dead end journey. And that's, that's what we find so often in our own lives, isn't it? We're faced with situations, we wonder why, why, why did the Lord allow this to happen? No, we don't know, we don't know at the time. Perhaps we'll never know in this world. There are some questions we won't know the answer to until we reach the Father's house. And so it is here. So the first movement then, um, dead end journey. Secondly, we have a painful conversation, verse 8 to the first part of verse 19. <clears throat> Once again, we are told nothing of the details of the journey. And the story moves forward here by dialogue, by conversation. And it's a painful conversation. But there are one or two things which are very important. Verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead. Even the phrase the dead shows the terrifying finality of what's happened. 
But this phrase, deal kindly, this is the great covenant word mentioned for the first time here, the love that God has for his people. And what our author is suggesting is that the covenant love of God is already at work. Now, I'm sure Naomi wasn't thinking of it in that way, but nonetheless, the fact the author uses this word, it's extremely important. Now, the other thing is some of the commentators condemn Orpah. I think that's most unfair. Orpah did not, Orpah did not want to leave Naomi. Orpah longed to stay with her. And after all, it's Naomi herself who tries to persuade the young woman to return. We got to remember that we are human and not be super spiritual. Oh, she should have done this, she should have done that. If I'd been there, I would have done that. How do we know? We know nothing of the circumstances. We know nothing of the situation. So there is, in the background, although it's not visible, and it's not going to be visible immediately, God loves God's covenant with his people. Now, the second thing in verses 12 to 13 is the danger of limiting God. Now, what Naomi says, of course, is perfectly, perfectly reasonable. I'm not going to marry. We don't know what age she would be, but she obviously felt she was too old to marry now. And even if she did marry, and even if she was able to have children, you girls are not going to wait for years and years until they're grown up. You see, it's, it's um, an impossibility. But there's something deeper than that. This is the way we often think in the time of great problems, don't we? I don't know about you, but when I'm faced with a problem and pray about it, my great temptation is to tell the Lord what he ought to do. You know, Lord, if I were... I don't actually use these words. You know, Lord, if I were you, I would do one of the following things. The Lord, praise his name, not being me, does none of these things. And then, of course, I panic because I cannot possibly see how a human impossibility can be resolved. And, and this, is, this is the point that's being made here, surely, that Naomi is thinking only in terms of human possibilities, and more especially, human impossibilities. And she says in verse, um, in the verse 13, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me, mentioned Job earlier, that's exactly the phrase that Job uses in chapter 19, that um, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, <clears throat> think about that for a minute. It's a terrifying thing. Naomi is obviously feeling trapped as Job felt trapped. But she's absolutely right theologically. <clears throat> The Bible refuses to allow there to be any other power in the universe equal to God. Prophet Isaiah says, I, the Lord, create good and evil. Because we tend to think too easily that Satan is equal and opposite to God. He is not. He is of tremendous power, but he is not equal and opposite. Whatever happens happens because the Lord's hand has chosen it. And the solution, of course, lies there as well. No power can prevent him from bringing life from death. Human, human impossibility, of course. Um, you're not going to, I, I won't have any more sons. And even if I do, you can't possibly wait till they grow up. We all realize that's nonsense. But only the Lord can bring life out of death. And that is the consistent story of the Bible. I always feel when I read the book of Genesis, the end of the book is very dismal. Joseph died and was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Very downbeat ending for a book that began in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, until we remember that we believe in a God who knows his way out of the grave. That is the point. Naomi doesn't know her way out of the grave. We don't know our way out of the grave, but God knows his way out of the grave. So, you see what's happening here. Naomi is limiting God. In one sense, she's totally wholly orthodox. It's God who has brought this about. In another sense, she's trying to solve the problem by human reasoning. But I think the other thing in this conversation 
and it shines brightly, is the faith of Ruth. The passionate and beautiful words of verses 16 and 17. Do not urge me to leave you, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. <clears throat> your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. He uses the Lord's name to underline that with an oath. Do you realize this young woman from Moab is standing by the side of Abraham himself? She is doing what Abraham did. And Abraham had the call and the promise. Ruth has neither. By the way, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Ruth is greater than Abraham. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is there is an astonishing leap of faith on this young woman's part. She is going to commit herself to the Lord of the covenant. Now, we are not Ruth, to coin a phrase, but the all genuine faith is like this. Hebrews 11 says, whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Ruth is an example, example of that, isn't she? She came to God believing that he is, <clears throat> not the gods of Moab, but the God of Israel, and he rewards those who diligently seek him. You see the pain of this conversation, though, Orpah leaving, she, Ruth would no doubt be distressed at Orpah leaving. She, no doubt, she would like all of us wonder, have I done the right thing? Have I, is this too much? But yet she, she goes in faith. So you see, we have the dead end journey. We have the painful conversation. And finally, <clears throat> in the last few verses, second part of 19 up to the end of the chapter, we have an unhappy arrival. Now, when they came, the whole town was stirred. Again, remember, this is not a worldwide event. This is a small village where everybody knew everybody else. And the return of Naomi would inevitably be the subject of local gossip. So we mustn't read too much into this. I want you to notice two things here. First of all, that Naomi focuses on herself. The woman says this, she said, do not call me Naomi, which means sweet or pleasant, and Mara, which means bitter. This again is a challenge to the Lord, because you see the Lord has, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. I wonder if there is something here underneath the surface. I went out full. In one sense, Naomi is empty. In another sense, she is still full, far too full of herself. Naomi is focusing on herself. You know, we use this phrase, so and so is full of himself. Now, I think this may be being suggested here. The Almighty has brought calamity on me. She appears to do nothing to welcome Ruth or introduce her and so on. It's so realistic and so human. Because the way Naomi reacts is the way all of us react in a time of tragedy and disaster, isn't it? We feel cheated. We feel we've been robbed. We feel that God has treated us harshly. Sometimes there's guys that say, oh, life hasn't treated me well. What we mean is God hasn't treated me well. So Naomi focuses on herself. But that's not how the chapter ends. When did they come to Bethlehem? At the beginning of the barley harvest. Once again, the book ends of the chapter. There was a famine. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Famine and harvest. The Lord of the harvest is at work, both in the physical harvest and in the harvest that's going to follow. And we begin to see the outcome of this in, in chapter 2. Harvests are a blessing from God. Throughout Scripture we get that. I mean, the book of Haggai, for example, the Lord says, the, the harvests are failing because you've forgotten me. And in time of Elijah, famine was sent as a punishment in order to bring people back to God. So you see, at the end of this story, not the end of the story, but the end of this section of the story, 
Naomi is feeling bitter. I'm sure she's feeling bitter as well as saying the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. So two things as we come to a close. The first thing is God is at work behind the scenes. Not quite so much behind the scenes as in the book of Esther, where his name isn't even mentioned, but nevertheless, he doesn't speak in the book, and his name isn't mentioned a great deal, but he is there. So often in our own lives, that's the case, isn't it? There are times when we feel the presence of the Lord, but an awful lot of the time, we don't, and we have to live by faith. And secondly, he is the Lord of the good times and of the bad times. And this is totally relevant to us, isn't it? It's easy to believe in the time of barley harvest that he is the loving God. It's very difficult to believe when the judges are ruling and there's a famine in the land. So this, this message is relevant to us. <clears throat> whether, as we'll sing in a moment, our joy is morning sun, or whether we are weeping in the night. In both these situations, the Lord is in charge. So may we know much of his blessing in this year we have begun in the company of this wonderful little book of Ruth. Amen. Let's pray. Lord of the harvest, Lord, who is still present in times of famine. Lord, of our joys and of our sorrows. Lord, of our little stories and of the big story. We pray that as we continue our journey into the unknown, that we may indeed be like Ruth. We will not return from following you. That your people shall be our people, and our God, our God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing together now the hymn on the screen, Come People of the Risen King, who delight to bring him praise.
The Apostle Peter writes, um, After we have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And until that glad day, may the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the strength of the Lord Jesus uh, fit us for his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And may the power of the Lord Jesus bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.